Welcome to the Biz Coach Show. In every episode, we share information and advice for small business owners, small business leaders, startups, and entrepreneurs preparing to launch their business. Our mission is to give entrepreneurs the edge they need to succeed. If you're in need of business coaching, head over to mybizcoaches.co and book your free coaching consultation today. The Biz Coach Show is presented by Eric Whitmoyer, the owner of My Biz Coaches, a business coach, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker, as well as David Macon, a certified professional in talent development, growth expert, writer, and small business strategist. Well, Eric, how are you doing today? I'm doing excellent, David, and yourself? I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good. I don't know excellent. about excellent, so you may have me beat there, but I'm doing pretty good. So <laughs> always good to hang out with you. And uh, yeah, we've got a, a good topic here today. Um, it's interesting. You know, obviously you're, you're posting a lot on LinkedIn. And by the way, if you guys don't follow Eric on LinkedIn, um, definitely search him up. He's always posting great articles, content. Definitely want to check that out. Uh, but you had uh, kind of shared or reshared a post on the dream team and uh, and kind of the importance of building a dream team, especially as a small business owner. And uh, just kind of wanted to, to dive a little bit deeper into that topic here today. So when we're talking about dream team, kind of walk us through, you know, why is this an important concept and what kind of uh, got you excited about kind of reposting that? Yeah, I appreciate that, David. Let me um, let me start with the 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 concept of a dream team and and. I think one of the opportunities here in, in the context of the messaging that was out on the LinkedIn, uh, as, a, as you mentioned, I reposted somebody else's content. And one of the one of the topics was how challenging it could be to develop a dream team. Right. Yeah. And and the uh, although I agree with it, theoretically, the reality is it's not impossible to develop a dream team. It does take time. It does require a process. And. Um, we'll actually spend some time today going through the nine steps that I outlined in the email or the uh, post that I shared. Uh, but um, sorry, scratch that. I didn't actually share the nine steps. I have the nine steps. I'm going to share those today. Uh, but um, I told them that there is a, a good process that I have. I believe it works really well to develop that dream team. But, um, you know, we, we, the when people hear that, often they think of, uh, you know, uh, unique teams, uh, the 92 U.S. Olympic basketball, men's basketball team, right? That was uh, that was the original, original dream team. Yeah, there you go. And uh, the original dream team, the challenge uh, with that is it was, um, for, for lack of a better uh, description, it, it basically it was it was uh, lightning striking, right? It was, yeah. it was the one in one in, uh, you know, a couple of million or whatever it is. But the it was a unique circumstance because up until that point in the Olympics, they hadn't allowed professionals to to to. Uh, play or, or participate in the Olympics. Uh, and that was the first year that they did. And then we were able to uh, put a pretty significant um, team together to, to compete and they, they crushed the Olympics. Um, but um, that aside, you know, there's, there's a unique dichotomy to that because um, if you compare that to, for instance, the 1980 U S hockey men's hockey team, uh, for for about 20 years, from 1960 to 1980, the U.S. Uh, men's hockey uh, was not competitive at all. Uh, and, and, and the biggest gripe was because most of the Eastern European teams and many other uh, teams in the, in the, throughout the world had professional players playing on their Olympic team, even though that seemed to be – that wasn't technically the way it was supposed to be created. You weren't allowed to be – you weren't supposed to be a professional player playing in the Olympics. And so for the longest time, this was a big issue because it was, um, you know, it was a, it was it was questionable as to whether or not all the teams were playing on the same level playing field. Right. And all of that aside, the in 1980, uh, I can't remember his last name, but Herb um, was the coach of that U.S. Olympic hockey team. And, and, and he pulled together, he banded together a number of uh, they were all college uh, students, graduates, some of them, uh, all played at different, uh, you know, at the collegiate level. None of them were professionals, uh, but he was able to put a team on the ice that played together as a team. Um, none of them were superstars, uh, it, certainly superstars at the collegiate level, but the, the leap from collegiate to professional is pretty substantial for those of you who are not familiar with the professional sports. And um, it's likely, uh, I, I remember, I can't remember the specific statistic, but the percentage of people that go from collegiate to professional is probably the top. If it's if it's not at least 10%, it might even be lower than that. 
Uh, but it's it's definitely a very small percentage of, of people that convert from collegiate to professional. Anyway, the point was that that team actually won, took the gold medal uh, and beat what at that time was the most um, um, dominant team in the Olympics uh, right. on, an internet, on an international level, which was the, the Russian team. And uh, they had owned the, the Olymp Olympics and, and all international competition uh, in hockey, men's hockey, for, for about 20 years. And <clears throat> to continue to put out teams like that, you know, with that at, and compete at that level, right, at that, uh, un, un, uh, it was unheard of. And so for the U.S. team to beat them with a bunch of no names that just come out of college because they learned to be, play together as a team, they had a very specific strategy. They had a very specific process. The coach uh, was adamant about what it was going to take to beat that particular team because they were the team to beat for certain. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, they actually beat them in the in the bronze medal round, and then went on to beat the other team. The uh, and I, I couldn't tell you who it was at this time. It was Sweden or uh, one of the Norwegian teams or something like, like somewhere that. where it snows a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right. But the point was, is that they, that was really unique in, in the sense that there were no professionals and we were still able to do it. We were still able to overcome it. Um, great story. That if you ever watched the movie Miracle, that was, uh, it was it kind of uh, pulls that together. It's a great, uh, great opportunity to kind of learn more about that. But um, that aside, when you kind of talk about the dream team, it, the reason it is so hard to build the dream team is, is because you have a lot of ego. Yeah. Generally speaking, when you're talking about a dream team, you're talking about the best of the best in their areas. And if um, if you have a lot of people that are really good at what they do, there's a lot of ego involved in that. Ironically, if you're not necessarily a big uh, fan of sports, you can also watch um, Oppenheimer. Hmm. Uh, Oppenheimer was about uh, uh, Dr. Oppenheimer, who who was <laughs> the uh, created the atom bomb. Uh, but uh, was it was the hydrogen. I think it was the atom. Here's the atom bomb. But uh, and the, the, the point is, is that the team that he created to build that, um, you know, put all the political stuff aside and all that kind of just and all the wartime stuff put it all aside. The people he brought together to work on that project were some of the smartest people in the world. Yeah. And to be the orchestrator that ties all those key people together, all that ego everything that's evolved around being the best at what you do and then taking the best of what you do and the best of what I do and the best that somebody else does and tying that all together and having all those people work in unison is, is an exception yeah. like that is, that is far and away probably one of the most challenging things to try and do. So to be fair to the person that posted on the, uh, on the follow-up on that, on the uh, dream team post to talk about how hard it is, it is difficult, difficult for certain um, and one of the things that I would venture to say is, is that um, you may find that your dream team isn't necessarily a combination of all of the best of the best in those categories. They may be the top 5% right? or the top 10%. They'll definitely be some of the best, but you may not find that those individuals necessarily play together with, well with others. Yeah, almost guaranteed they won't, in fact, I'd say, right? And, and you have to be More a strong enough leader to manage those personalities. And that's the key, right? Yeah. That's uh, and that's honestly that would be the comment that I would share with somebody when they're talking about building a dream team, is that the individual in charge of that team, the leader that's pulling all of that together, the one that is in fact orchestrating all of that, they have to be confident enough in their skills and their abilities to to know that they're recruiting people that are probably way better in certain areas of whatever it is that you're focused on than yeah. they are themselves. Um, and they're confident in their own abilities and their ability to get people to work together in unison. And they're, they have enough confidence in their confidence in their strategies and their concepts, you know, what they believe is going to work because otherwise the egos will, will, you know, <laughs> they'll just, they'll just yeah. tear it apart. Right. You'll, you'll just run into problem after problem after problem. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to your point, the likelihood of the best of the best being able to play together, hmm, that might be a stretch, but you don't to have a true dream team in my eyes, I'm saying it's a combination between the 80 Olympic team with a phenomenal strategy who took the best of the best and made them play together as a team, yeah. as well as the 92 basketball Olympic team that was really some of the best of the best in that regard, right? So you take right. the combination of the two. It may not be the very best at every position or every skill set, 
but it'll be some of the best in the world. And you get them to play together as, as a group. And then what you can accomplish is, is off the charts. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I thought we were going to be talking about space jam when we were talking about dream team, but <laughs> apparently I was off. It's the 1992 team. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, David, we know that your understanding of, uh, you know, many of this, <laughs> this sports is not, not quite. I, I could have zoned out for about five minutes there, but <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> uh, Lord of the Rings, maybe, you know, Gandalf, yeah, yeah, there you, go. Like it, you know, okay. I don't know, maybe, I don't know. But All right, so if the elves come together with the dwarves. <laughs> yes, yeah, okay, now I'm getting it, now I'm getting it. <laughs> awesome. No, so as you were saying that, too, one of the things I was thinking about was, and I think we've talked about it in a couple episodes, is um, kind of the talent development strategy around you can build talent, you can borrow talent, or buy talent, right? So yes. when you're assembling a team, traditionally, I prefer – to build a team, right, and get them to a level where they're at, you know, peak performance. Um, that's not always the right strategy or the best strategy, right? You can borrow talent where you're hiring, you know, freelancers or contractors or whatever, subcontract things out, um, or you can uh, buy, right, which you, you know, it's going to be expensive to get the top 10% to your point, even top 20%, and you got to be able to throw, you know, a decent comp package their way to get that person on your team. And so I think it's important to understand you know, you're going to have to have some pain in that process one way or the other, whether it's, you know, time and effort or financially, uh, but that's what it takes to get that team assembled. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and all of that said, without the right strategy, yeah, it won't work. True. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and then that's the piece that I think that, um, and I think that honestly, I think that's the piece that a lot of people are, are, are will, will shy away from. Yeah. Right. If if you're, you know, it's, I, I say this because I felt I was pretty good at managing strong teams, but yep. the, the reality is is that um, uh, you have to have a certain level of confidence, almost borderline overconfident, yeah. to be able to to take on a task like that and 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 challenge people in a way that makes them dig deep. Because remember, the, the key of a, the the key role of a leader isn't necessarily to uh, uh, it, it isn't isn't about the leader. Right. It's about the leader getting the best out of the individual contributors and then working together as a cohesive unit. So an effective leader that can really pull in a top quality talent, a multiple top quality talents, like you were suggesting, that that really that's a whole nother piece to it. So, it, it, again, you know, regardless of you know, when you who who's on your dream team, your dream team has to have a phenomenal leader. Yeah. Right. right. And so and then as you pull it together, they have to have a, a really strong strategy that's going to accentuate your strengths, you know, uh, uh, offset your, your weaknesses and, and, and recognize how you can uh, and even then assess who's your competition. Right. Right. It's particularly, you know, depending on 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 the. Um, you know, the field of battle that you're, you're choosing, right? The reality is you need to also know who your competition is so you can know how best to leverage those opportunities. Yeah. Awesome. Well, hey, I know you've got a couple of things that you've used over the years to assemble some pretty amazing teams, dare say dream team. Um, and I think what nine, nine kind of key things that you think about when you're going through that process, do you want to walk us through that? Sure. Absolutely. So the, uh, the first one is, is to observe. I, I think that in any scenario, you have to you have to do your due diligence. You have to look at what is um, the project as a whole. What are you trying to accomplish? Uh, how does everything fit together? For instance, you know, using any of those analogies that we referenced, whether it's basketball or hockey or or, or building an atom bomb uh, or building a good sales team, a sales organization, for instance, right? The the reality is is that you have to know what you need, right? You have to be able to look at that compare that to other teams, compare it to other scenarios, compare it to past experience, um, project out what would you really like, what would it look like if it was perfect, right? And kind of draw back and forth between those corollaries uh, and then ultimately determine what it is, um, you know, what are you already familiar with? Yeah. What, what, do, what do you know um, that you're inherently competent in? And then do the due diligence um, of what it is you need to understand. So the, the second piece of that then is to determine what are the most critical roles. Right. So, you know, if um, if you're, for instance, I'll use the basketball analogy. If there's a a very critical role, for instance, in basketball, who handles the ball? Right. We call it a point guard. Uh, whoever, whoever handles the ball, that's a very intricate part of the of the entire operation. Right. Because not only do they handle the ball and they control the speed and pace and tempo of the of the of the game, but they also determine where the ball goes. 
And so often what we find is, is that, um, you know, as you're kind of assessing your team, right? For instance, uh, you're trying to build a phenomenal sales organization. You also have to have an exceptional sales support team. Yeah. Right. Who supports that sales team? And if the sales support team isn't strong enough to keep up with the level of talent that you have on your sales organization, you will struggle. Right. If your fulfillment team can't keep up with the volume of the performance of the sales performance, you will struggle. Yeah. Right. So all the pieces have to work together. It's not just building a great sales or uh, sales team. If you want a successful sales organization, you need all the different contributing components need to be act equally um, um, up to par. You can't have just one without the other. But what are the most critical and then determine who are the players in that space? Yeah. Right. Who can you go after if you're to your point, if you're buying the talent? Um, can you afford to buy that talent? Uh, right. Can you build up? Can you build your own internal talent? Right. And yeah. and can they compete at that level? Right. right. Uh, so that's a that's a big one is it's determining those pieces. Then you review it, uh, begin to determine who you already know. Who do you know? Who do you have access to? Who who can be part of this dream team that you already have connections with that are going to allow you to uh, quickly I you know quickly bring key people in because part of recruiting uh, to a dream team is having other dream team players. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because if I if I come to you, David, and I say, hey, I'm building this dream team, and I think you're a perfect fit. And you're like, who else do you have on the team? And I'm like, nobody yet. You're you're probably a little bit more apprehensive to join the team. Right. Yeah, yeah. Or or you get there and you're like, this this is my teammates. Like this is not. <laughs> I thought they'd be at least my caliber, maybe even better, so I can learn exactly. something. Exactly. Right? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So and and you know, especially in and I think that that part of that also plays in the fact of recognizing what the key roles are. In step two allows you that in step three is you begin to recruit for that that top talent. If there's you know a couple of key players that you're like, man, this is really be if I can get this person, yeah, um, to be on that team, um, I know that the odds of me getting that person are even better if I can get this person first. Yeah, right. And so if I fix if I get this person on the team and I know they're on, or even these two people on the team, this person will come along because they 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 they're, they want to be part of that. Well, the uh, interesting comment on that is there, there's a great book. It's um, I forget the author. If I if I think of it or find it, I'll put in the show notes. But um, it's a player strategy, and it's and it's attracting those top performers. But one of the things is when you're recruiting that high performing individual, asking right, who else do you know that you think would be a fit for the team? That Absolutely. Building, right? And then because they're you know probably <clears throat> have eagles flying together, so they probably know somebody. That's a great point, and to 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 that point. Because eagles do fly to uh, fly together, right? They are, no, actually, that's not entirely accurate. Actually, eagles fly alone, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but um, they they probably know other eagles. That, that, that's probably the analogy, right? There you go. There you go. The point is, is that somebody who operates at that level knows other. That's actually there. You go. It's a great analogy. SEAL team operators. Yeah. Right. Perfect. Anybody who operates at an elite level in the military, I don't care if they're Navy, Army, Marines, whatever. If they're an elite operator, they know of other elite operators. Right. Yeah. And they know who they want to work with. Yeah. So again, using this that dream team analogy, um, while you're recruiting, and be like, yeah. David, who else do you think would be a good fit for our team? Yep. Right. Because then that that and and the best part about that is that, for all intents and purposes, you're going to recognize these are people I already have good synergies with. Yes, absolutely. So yep. that reduces the amount of time that that the leader then has to as is going to have to spend time trying to create those synergies. Right. Absolutely. But you also, side note, you also don't want too much synergy yeah. that you fall into routines that allow you to, that 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 would cause you to potentially gravitate down because it, this is my comfort zone. If you're not outside your comfort zone, you're not actually operating at a high level. Yeah, yeah, true. You need right? a little. You, you what I'm you saying? Not, you may not be stretching. Heads. Yeah, absolutely. You may not be stretching yourself enough. So it's it's that finding that that unique balance. Yeah. But you mentioned earlier too, you know, getting like in the sales versus sales operations versus fulfillment, it's important to think about how those different functional areas of the business or those individuals counterbalance one another, right? Because if you're too lopsided in one aspect of your business, that is going to create some significant challenges, right? And people aren't going to feel empowered to do things or may not have the resources they need or the confidence, you know, if you're a leader that's not backing them, they may not have the confidence to challenge 
that person that's pulling all the resources or effort, right? Those sorts of things. And so, um, yeah, keeping an eye on that, keeping those things in harmony is, is a real challenge. Yeah, absolutely. And again, all the more reason that you have to have a super strong leader. Yep. And, and, and as I say, I keep referencing leader. You also have um, the leader that's, that's managing the team, but you also have leaders within the group. Yeah. yeah right? right. Depending on how big the team is, you likely have a secondary and even a tertiary leader. Yeah. And and each of them plays a significant role in maintaining certain components of the team. Right. It could right. be, it could be um, energy level. It could be um, continuity within the group. Right. It could be. I mean, there's just a number of different things you could play into that You know, outside of strate- strategy. Uh, for instance, I think back again to the U.S. Olympic hockey team, as we referenced that um, Herb. And I want to say it was Keller, but I can't remember, so I'm not going to specifically say. It. But um, as the head coach, he had his 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 assistant coach, and his entire role was making sure that all the players played well together, that that they gelled personally, interpersonally, right? All their different, uh, you know, he he handled that part of it so that the coach could focus on what he was focused on. Yeah. Um, and 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 clearly identified that from the very beginning, and he said, "This is your role." Yeah. Right. And so, you know, again, and that goes back to that strategy and being very clear on what the strategy is, because then you can identify those those responsibilities and yeah. people are are very familiar with what they're what's expected of them. Yeah. I want to clarify something you said to a, make sure I understand and make sure it's clear for our audience. So when you're talking about that secondary and tertiary leadership, are you talking about a formal, you know, hierarchical structure? Or are you talking about like the team captain that's the leader within a peer group? Great, great clarifying question. Yeah, I'm talking about like the team captain, cool. not a traditional. Yeah, just somebody who's the, you know, if you if you're again, if you're using a sports analogy, it'd be the the, the, the team captain, right? That that kind of leads the group while they're on the floor, but the, the coach is standing out, out, out on the on the sidelines, right? Yeah. Directing yeah. and orchestrating from the outside. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. And I said you always see that in meetings too, right? Where it's the person that they look at when they're not sure if they want to say something and they're hoping that that person does. That's the peer leader that they're hoping <laughs> has the team's back and is going to talk to the leader about it. Right. So there's right, always right. Yeah, right, exactly. somebody, somebody's in that role and it's important to know who that person is and, and understand the influence they have on the group dynamics for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So, what's the next point? So the fourth step is interviewing, right? Uh, while you're doing your research, you should have uncovered people that are the best at with the roles that they have. Uh, begin to talk to them. Um, you also, while you're doing the interview process, you're gleaning insight into your project. And this is likely, if you're building a dream team, you're you're doing you're you're setting off to do a project that's never been accomplished before, mm. right? So while you're doing that and you're talking to the best of the best in the world, theoretically, or in your space, whatever the case may be, you're going to gain insight, right? Even though you may be the leader, the coach, whatever you want to refer to it as, is the person who's bringing this all together, bringing these people together. You have this strategy. Your strategy may not be perfect, yeah. And 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 the best leaders recognize that they don't always have all the answers. Yeah. Um, so and who else best to learn from than some of the best people in the world at what they do? Yeah. Right. Or in their space. Right. So so considering that, recognize that you're dealing with some really high level knowledge individuals, and that are going to be able to help you identify things that you didn't clearly understand. Again, I'll use the Oppenheimer. Um, analogy, if you watch that movie, you will see that there are times where Dr. Oppenheimer is engaging with these different um, physicists and, and, and other uh, chemists and what, you know, whatever their, their, their uh, scientists back, you know, sci- scientific backgrounds are or whatever. Um, and they're correcting him on some of the theories hmm. or they're adjusting theories. I mean, that, that some of the things that some of the, the insights and knowledge that came out of that project were world changing. Yeah. Right. And, and, and because you were able to get the smartest people in the world, so to speak, together on a particular project, uh, you were able to learn from one another and challenge theories that had been tried and true theories for many, many years in, in some cases. Yeah. Right. So w- what's interesting about that is, is it, as a, as an, as an intelligent leader going into a scenario like this, as you're beginning to interview, you're going to have people provide you, just like you mentioned, you know, David, who else would you know that might be a good fit for this project, right? Right. What else do you know that I should know about embarking on this project? Mm-hmm. Because I may not be able to bring you in, David. You might not be interested in my project. It might be, not be the right time for you. Um, but you feel obligated to tell me that I might want to consider this particular 
cons- you know, point, whatever, yeah. right? And, and incorporate that because if you're if you've got the best people in the world, you want to glean as much insight as you can from them. So yeah. what a great opportunity to do that while you're going through that interview process. Love that. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Let's move on to the next one. I want to clarify something here again too. Um, yep. So one is, uh, and maybe maybe it's both. I don't know, but you're talking about you you may be embarking on something that hasn't been done. So I want to tap into that for just a second. So one question or thought on that is. Are you saying you only need a dream team when you're trying to do these big things mm-hmm. that you know Great haven't point. been done before, and maybe you don't always need a dream team, or is it you're only going to get the best if if you've got this amazing mission, right? If you have a mediocre mission, you're not going to get superior talent. So is it one of those, both of those? Like, what help us unpack that a little bit? Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, one, I would initially say yes. <laughs> You will you will struggle to get the best people unless the project is worthy. Mm. Yeah. So if the project's not worthy, you're going to have a really hard time getting a dream team put together. Yeah. The project has to be compelling enough to bring the best of the best together. So like now, destroying the one ring in the Mount of Mount of Fire, Mount Doom. Right? That, <laughs> yeah. that kind of project. Not sure what movie that's from, but yes, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. The, the, the reality is, is that unless the project is big enough, and the, you know, honestly, David, this goes back to a topic we've talked about many times before. Uh, tight, um, uh, level B and level C players will not play with level A players. Yep. Right. Or uh, sorry, right, we won't, yeah, won't work for. Yeah. yeah. It won't work for B and yeah. C's won't work for a level A play. Right. If I'm a type, if I'm an A player, um, B's B. Uh, I'm sorry. If I'm an A leader, I'll be able to recruit anybody I want to recruit. Yeah. But if I'm a B or C leader, I will not recruit type uh, A A level players, right? I just yeah, won't. Yeah. They won't gravitate gravitate to me. Yeah. Right. If they do, they won't stay along. Yeah, I'd say even more so generationally now, because people are like, if I can't learn something from you, you're not helping advance my career, whatever. I'm moving on, right? I'm going to go find somebody that can. Exactly. Exactly. So, I, and I think that that plays the same way in the regards to the project. Now, when I say the project has to be worthy, it doesn't have to be creating the atom bomb. It doesn't have to be competing in the Olympics, but it does have to be a worthy project, right? So, um, I will actually go back into my 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 personal experience, and you can relate to this. We've talked about this immensely. There was a period of time where my sales organization and our previous employer was the number one sales organization for over two and a half years, right? Yep. And I, I I tell people when I share this story, it's not to beat my chest. It's to help illustrate how significant the accomplishment was. Right. We were the number one division in the company for a wireless dealer that was the number one dealer in the nation right. based on, on metrics, uh, on, on key metrics um, for, for, for a carrier that was the number one carrier in the nation based on net subscribers. Right. Right. So we're, we're, it was like the best of the best of the best. Yeah. The true upper okay. echelon, right. The top echelon of, of dealers and That's sales for, people. For two and a half years. Yeah. Right. So we were beating the best of the best for two and a half years. Right. And it's yeah. like, when, when you, when you think about that, it's like, okay, if we were number one in our company. Okay. That's great. Yeah. That's good. Right. And we were a decent sized company, 140, locations um, during 130, 140 locations during that time. Uh, I think we probably had 15, 1800 employees, maybe 2000 employees. I don't remember exactly, but um, no, probably, probably about 1500 employees. But my point is, is we were able to do that at a time when the company that we were representing, the brand, the product that we were representing was the most popular brand in the nation. Yeah. Right. Based on net subscribers, I mean they, they were outproducing the other carriers. Um, so when you when you look at what we were doing with a brand that on a national scale was the best of the best, and we were outproducing those guys, and we were the best team within that organization at that right. time. Yeah, it's the best of the best of the best. And the reality is, we did it for two and a half years now, and and we didn't we didn't just scrape by. Many months we were beating people by fifteen or twenty percent. So I'm not going to say that we created a dream team per se, but I would definitely say that in the space that we were in and the time that we did it and what we accomplished, it was pretty darn close, probably as close as I'll ever get in my career, at least to this point anyway, the closest I've been to putting something like that together. And yeah. I did it with a completely unique and different strategy 
I did it because I focused on personnel development and 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 creating better leaders, not and focusing on tactical execution of day in and day out, stra- stra- you know, uh, um, tactics. Yeah. Right. I, it was it was it was much bigger than that, and not everybody saw my vision. As a matter of fact, it it was it was a challenge over those years, particularly the first six or eight months before the 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 results started kicking in. A lot of people were pushing back. Yeah. Well, and, and how much easier was it for you to attract and retain top tier talent when you had the team winning and achieving those results? Oh, it was, it was night and day. I yeah. mean, I can, I could pick a particular market off the top of my head that I remember a year prior to that time frame, we were struggling to find people to come work for us. I mean, it was, yeah. it was like pulling, you know, it was like, it was probably the worst, uh, it wasn't the worst, definitely one of the worst scenarios I had with trying to recruit talent. Fast forward a year later, and we have people picking up and moving from where they live to go work in that market, to have the yeah. opportunity because it was so good, right? I mean, yeah. we're talking about people that didn't even work within our organization at that time, leaving where they live to come work at our company in that market because there yeah. was so much so much of an opportunity. Yeah. I mean, people people want to be on a winning team, right? That's I it. Mean, there, there's a lot to that financially. I mean, the pride, right? All those sorts of things. And, Opp- and if you're just for- opportunity. Yeah, totally. And yeah. I think if you're if you haven't achieved the results yet, maybe you're just starting your business in your early stages, right? Then you have to have a winning vision and you need to project that winning type of confidence to the people you're trying to bring in. Yeah. And that's um it's <laughs> one of the pieces we talk about. That is uh that is probably one of the hardest parts as a yeah. leader of trying to build that team, right? Is is having the confidence and sticking with it, right? Yeah. Um, so recruiting that, that, you know, the next step is to recruit, continue to look for and, and find the best talent that, you know, and, and, and recognize though, as I mentioned before, you may not always get the best of the best, but if you're in that top echelon, that top, you know, three, five, seven, 10%, um, they're uh, in that caliber, yeah. but they can play as a team, then that's right. the right fit. Yeah. Right. Because if they're, if they're so isolated in their individual performance, that they can't be a contributor in the team. Uh, you know what our organization was like. Our our culture was you don't you don't if you find a a, a strategy that's winning, you don't just keep it to yourself and hoard right. it, right? Yep. You share it within the organization. A lot of everybody within the organization benefit from it. Yep. And uh, uh, a dream team would need to do that to be able to really benefit. Sure. So the sixth step is then to remember that a talent. So we already touched on this. A talent won't follow a, a B level leader. Right. And so we kind of touched on that. But uh, you need to be you, you must be sharp and prepared and fully committed to the project. I think it's another big thing to think about Yeah. Um, as the leader. If you are not 100 percent committed to seeing the project through, not only will you not find top talent, uh, you'll be lucky to find any talent <laughs> because people can sniff that out. And if you lack yeah. confidence then, you know, you, you again, you won't find the top talent, even even if you are a quality leader but you lack the confidence in achieving the objective, they'll, they'll sniff that out and they'll be like, yeah, I don't see you guys winning. I don't want to be part of a losing or operation. Yeah. So I'll, I would say just going back to the B leader, I'll uh, give you a chance for a shameless plug here. But um, I, I think if, if somebody does recognize, hey, I'm, I'm struggling to attract, retain, or develop an A player, and they look in the mirror and say, maybe it's me, what value does a business coach have for somebody like that? <laughs> Great question. Um, thank you for that softball, by the way. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think that the the most important uh, piece that uh, that any kind of coach would really bring in that space would be helping them identify what are uh, if, some, if somebody has that much self awareness to recognize that the that the reason they're not finding the talent could be themselves. Anybody yeah. who's bold enough to acknowledge that um, has what it takes to be an A leader. Yeah. They just might not have refined certain skills. So the yeah. best part about that analogy that you just shared is that if they had enough competency, enough, uh, enough um, what was the word I just used? Um, uh, they could self-identify and recognize that it possibly could be themselves. Yeah. That's huge. Right. Because right. I mean, that, that the level of, um, uh, of um, maturity, in their thinking process is pretty significant to, to, yeah. to come to that. Not often you don't see that with underdeveloped leaders. 
Yeah. Um, so a leader that's willing to admit that they could be the gap, right? And that, and more importantly, what are some of the things I could work on? It, that that's that's what you need right there. Then as a coach, it's just yeah. identifying what are what are the potential gaps, and it could be something as simple as, um, you know, you have a tendency not to listen effectively, yeah. right? right. And it's like you, you hear but don't listen, right? The words come in, but you still move forward with your own ideas, and you're not allowing people to collaborate. Yeah. Um, you know, in a winning team, there's going to be collaboration. There needs to be collaboration. If you have the best of the best, you have to be able to, to collaborate. And even though as the leader, you have to be clear on your strategy and committed to it and all that kind of stuff, you also have to recognize that if what you're doing isn't working, Yeah. then then you have to be willing to pivot and adjust accordingly. And so, yeah. um, you know, a strong leader is going to be able to, to uh, a, a successful leader will need to be able to recognize that and adjust to that a good coach will help somebody I self identify. Yeah. Um, and, and I and think, find that. Yeah. And I think it, it's important for, you know, small business owners that are watching or listening to this, right. There, there's no, there's nobody above you, like in an organization, you know, you don't have a CEO that's telling you, you know, Hey, let me help you guide you or direct you and give you career feedback or, you know, some other supervisor. So where do you get it? Right. Unless you're just, insanely self-aware and and or you're really good at listening to feedback and implementing it you have to get outside perspective because it just doesn't exist in a small business if you're the owner right and that's really where that coach can come into play yeah absolutely and 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 i think that you know as you even say that david that, that gets one of the things that in the in the years since i developed my biz coaches uh or even as i embarked on this whole coaching business model um, what I've uncovered is that the, probably the single biggest uh, resource that that I bring to to a client is the ability to act as a sounding board. Yeah. To vet ideas, to challenge ideas, to to suggest nuances in in a strategy or something like that. Um, there's so much value in that that uh, that uh, uh, the owners. Um, may not necessarily be able to appreciate until they've worked with me long enough or a coach, I should say long enough to really see that play out. Yeah. Um, you know, the first couple of times you have an interesting conversation and around, you know, unintended consequences, right. Yeah. It's like, I, I, I remember doing that for years with our previous organization and, and kind of like, Hey, we, we had this idea, we executed on it. It got us results, but one of the unintended consequences that's played out now is it's created this issue. Yeah. And right. how do we how do we still continue to maximize the value of the results we're getting here while buffering against this unintended consequences detriment that we really don't want that's crept up now and caused a problem for us? Right. Makes sense. So, and it's not easy to see that without the the, the life experience to go along with it. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so the seventh step then is to don't forget an A team, uh, an A, uh, a dream team is only as powerful the cohesiveness of the team. Mm. Uh, if the group can't or won't work together, it certainly won't perform as a, a dream team. And again, I go back to the analogy of the basketball team versus the Olympic uh, goal. And I say that the 92 U.S. men's Olympic basketball team crushed everybody. I, I think they yeah. I remember a game they beat somebody by 50 points or something ridiculous like that. In a game that would normally go to 120 points, they beat them by 50 points. Um, that's not even in the same arena, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're going to play to all of our C players on the dream team and still beat them. You know, it's like, but, um, the, uh, what, what made the, the, again, the hockey team so, uh, so significant was the fact that they weren't necessarily that best of the best on a, on the, on an international scale, uh, but they were able to play together in a unique cohesive way that beat some of the best in the world. Yeah. Right. right. And so that was what, what made the, the difference very unique. And, and we've struggled immensely in years since to be able to field dream teams. Right. To, and that, are, that all that do compete on a competitive level with some of the bigger national team, international teams, because those international teams have learned the lesson. They've learned to play together as a team and they don't have the same structures and dynamic Issues in that you have all these egos trying to play together and all that fun stuff. So sometimes the best teams aren't necessarily the very best of the best. It's the best that can play together. Yeah. yeah. And so well I continue to bring that together and, 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 and bring that up as a key component of a team that's going to successfully play together and compete at that level. 
Um, another consideration is, is a dream team that performs at the highest level may not have uh, the best contributors at every role. I mentioned that earlier. Um, and, and, and I think that the, as you do the recruiting, vetting um, who, who's going to play best together is part of that recruiting process. Right. And, and um, there's an assessment component that I used to do um, that I think that good leaders do is they recognize what are, what are the triggers for a guy like David? What sets him off? What, what really makes him excel at the next level? What are, what are the things that um, uh, will send David in this downward spiral? Right. And as an effective leader, I need to know that all the time with any team that I manage, but with a dream team, it's a whole nother level of that expectation, right? Sure. I have to know how far I can push you before you, you fold on me. I have to know how hard I can push you um, or, or, or what, what's, what's going to get you to, 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 to come back from a setback. Yeah. You know, I, I, I got to understand you at a level. So I have to be a really, really good coach leader, whatever you want to reference. Uh, because if I'm not, uh, and I, I, I'm not going to know how to get the best out of you. So really kind of di- diving into and understanding who's playing for me and, and, and how to get the best out of those individuals. And that, that if that's important in any leadership role, it's significantly more important with, with that type of caliber uh, of individual and going after a project that big. Yeah, that well, makes sense. Uh, and so the last thing is to remember that accomplishing something like this will likely take months and even years um, to bring it all together. Uh, but it will never happen if you wait until you have all the right pieces in place. Um, that just doesn't work. Um, like any work of art, this will likely be the culmination of time, energy, and other valuable resources, but it'll be worth it in the end. Yeah. Right. So that we talked about conviction, right. Sticking through it, even though it's not, doesn't seem to be working. Um, like anything in life, um, often if you look at it in a graph, you know, how things perform, um, you know, the, the, um, the slight edge, by um, I think it was Darren Hardy. Darren Hardy wrote the slide edge. Um, it, it talks about your progression in anything is is very minimal. So minimal it's like watching grass grow. <laughs> and then as momentum kicks in and as synergies come together, it starts taking off on, and you get the hockey stick effect where it just kind of yeah. takes off and goes up to the top right. Uh, but it takes a significant amount of time, and that you know how how much time that is varies from project to project. But if you're talking about something on this level. It will likely take much longer, um, and 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 to, to to and I think the other thing about that is, is you can't say you've arrived. Mm. Yeah, right. I, that, that's the last thing, and I would suggest in that Where complacency whole, creeps in. What's yeah, yeah, exactly. Because as soon as complacency does creep in, you are no longer the dream team. Yeah, right. Uh, but uh, yeah, so recognizing one that it's a long path and, and you have to have the conviction to stick to it and your team has to have the conviction to stick to it. Yeah. Um, right. And so so sticking with it, staying consistent with it, uh, acknowledging the nuances that you need to adjust as, uh, accordingly and, and, and making those adjustments as you move along. Um, but having a conviction to stick it out and to see that the fruit is to, to fruition. That's that's probably the last most important part. Nice. Well, hey, good points here. I've got two more questions for you just to wrap okay. it up here. These are curveballs. So good luck. Okay. Uh, for, <laughs> there was softballs earlier, now I'm doing curveballs. Uh, so going back to leadership, because that seems to be a, a big theme here, right? And, and I yep. dare say, based on what we've talked about, you're not going to have a dream team unless you're a tier A leader, right? So let me ask you this. Do you think every business owner has the capacity to become an A leader? No, no, every, every business owner does not. And here's why not every, because most business owners are, or at least were, or originally entrepreneurs at heart. Right. And, and probably still are. Um, And what makes a good entrepreneur doesn't necessarily make an exceptional leader. Yeah. Um, So one of the biggest opportunities and or challenges for any business owner is to be willing to step aside and allow somebody else to manage that team, to lead that team. And, uh, you know, we can, we can take, for example, um, uh, Steve Jobs, 
classic example, right? If anybody knows Steve Jobs' legacy, he was thrown out of Apple originally, and Apple was struggling immensely. Um, he was kicked out. I mean, there's a lot of nuances and BS and all that fun stuff behind it, but the reality was he he struggled as a leader significantly, mostly because of interpersonal skill sets, right? Yeah. He 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 was it was exceptional at getting everything out of top quality talent. But he was he was so harsh in the way that he did that that he blew through so many people. Yeah. Um, as he matured, he got better at finding that balance between the two. Right? How do I get the best without crushing people's souls? <laughs> um, and in doing so, he was able to create a phenomenal, you know, Apple that we know today. Right? Yeah. Uh, but there, uh, Apple in the early I don't know. 10, 15 years, maybe. I don't remember exactly when that, when that transition was. Might have been 20 years, close to. Um, it was on the verge of bankruptcy at least multiple times. Uh, and a lot of that wasn't just it wasn't just Jobs, although Jobs was part of that in the beginning. But eventually, he had to realize that he had to hand over the reins. In the early days, the organization forced him to. The board forced him to. Yeah. But later on, he realized, okay, where I'm best suited is here. This is the role I should play. Yep. And he did the technological advances and things like that. And he became a better leader over time. But there was a time that you wouldn't want him to lead your team because, you know, he might he might be able to push the engineers and challenge the engineers. But in the meantime, he could also blow out a whole bunch of people <laughs> Yeah, because sure. he pushed too hard. Right. So uh, and that's, you know, one extreme example. But the reality is that's very common for many owners. As yeah. a matter of fact, I saw a phenomenal video today by a gentleman by the name of Stephen Bartlett. He's on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, Sony, I've, I've, I've come to respect immensely. Uh, did a great example of exactly, he called it um, founder chaos. Mm. And the issue is, is that the, the uh, founder, right, has a passion and a vision. And they can see everything, every step from here to 20 years down the road. And they can see every little nuance of, of in, their, right, in their vision of their business. They can see every little component of it. And they see how it all intricately fits together. The average employee has no perspective and right. can't can't possibly envision, you know, anywhere a fraction of what the founder sees. And so the problem is, is that you know, having a conversation with like somebody like that who's very passionate about what they're trying to do, very much like I can do from time to time. <laughs> uh, very passionate about the goals, the, the, the ambitions and anticipations that I have for this business. Um, if you get me going on it, it will it will be distracting because you can't yeah. follow along because you don't see all these pieces the way that I see them. The same right. problem that Jobs had, quite honestly. Yeah. So in the grand scheme of things, the reality is, is most owners can't focus in on that that very that intricate step by step component, and, and they they get they get lost in it, and consequently the employees get lost and can't follow. And so yeah. uh, a good business owner that has that needs to recognize that they need to bring in a better coach. A great example, the owners of teams, professional teams do not coach. <laughs> yeah, good point. Right? They they bring in coaches. Yeah. Okay, well, that leads me to uh, something I want to get your perspective on. If you're a coach, you know, you're a big sports fan, and you have to choose between coaching the 1992 men's basketball team and the 1980 men's hockey team, which which team would you rather coach? I, I would take the hockey team. And why is that? Um, I, each each of the scenarios was uh, doing something that no something something that something something that somebody else has never done. Yeah. The difference with the basketball team, there had been a long period of time uh, where we weren't as competitive as we could have been. The, the the analogy with the hockey team and that 20 year drought of being embarrassed year after year after year on an international scale and not just with the Russians but with many of the competitive uh, U.S. hockey um, or uh, men's hockey teams throughout the throughout the world um, it was it was in my eyes and maybe I'm a little bit more partial to it because I I remember watching. That 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 uh, that that show or that um, on TV. I remember watching. It was the wild wide world of sports for anybody who's old enough to remember that. But uh, I remember watching that and literally watching the last couple of minutes of that game and watching them win. But my point being is that it was such of a dramatic uh, disparity 
from where we had been for 20 years to win that. It was, um, yeah, I, I just look at that and I say the difference was it was so much more of an adjustment or uh, I, I'm, try, I'm trying to think of the um, the word I want to use, but it was that much more of a difference from what the the 92 men's basketball team. It was like, if you can't win with this team, I don't know how you could. Right. <laughs> right. It, but what they accomplished was significant. I mean, it was like they really trounced people. Right. Yeah. The, and 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 what should have been a 20 year. Right continuation of that really wasn't not not in my eyes that the way that it should have been but the that that accomplishment that they had in the 1980 was pretty significant and to do it with with people like a ragtag team they were you know some of the best college players in the in the in the um in the united states although ironically most of them never went on as a matter of fact if you watch the movie miracle watch the very last uh very the they can what they do is they go through and they list all the players that were on that team yeah and what they personally and professionally accomplished most of them were not professional hockey players their careers were in business and law and other categories and other areas and they were pretty significant accomplishments i mean it was like yeah. after you learn how to do something that big like that you go on to even bigger things in your life yeah so it's pretty it's pretty significant to look at that and and i think that that says a lot about what what they were able to accomplish in that particular team and why i see the value in that yeah how did I know you were going to pick that? Because <laughs> I'm the quintessential underdog follower. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. Yeah, yeah. We both love a good underdog story. So, Cool. Well, hey, before we wrap up, uh, great conversation today. A lot of great points. Thanks for uh, kind of guiding us through that nine-step process that you use. Um, anything new kind of happening over at My Biz Coaches? Uh, you know, we, we, uh, we rebranded. We've gone with mybizcoaches.co. Um, the new site is up and running now. Uh, we made some adjustments. We were, uh, we're doubling down on our exposure on LinkedIn. So if you're looking for a new content, you'll certainly find a lot of it on LinkedIn. Uh, we've, um, uh, we'll, we'll be expanding into the other social media as we really refine the new, the new strategy and, and determine exactly where it is and where we want to go with that new, um, that focus that we're, we're really tying into. But, um, you know, talking about uh, some specific niches that we're looking to go into, particular categories where we really feel like there's certain clients we can help even better. Um, so we really want to dial those in, but certainly we're open to, uh, you know, we know we can help everybody. There's just certain categories of business where we think we can really make an impact and we want to focus on that a little bit more. But yeah, um, yeah. anyway, so th- as it stands right now, that's a, that's a big focus for our, our strategy for marketing was LinkedIn. And uh, excited to get more engaged with the clients. I think we can do that better uh, with with followers. Sorry, um, I think we can do that better by uh, by mastering one of the social medias instead of just kind of shotgun across all of them. So I'm yeah. excited to see how many people we can generate, get more exposure, and get more listeners and and, and followers for for even our channel here. Yeah, yeah. And I'll just say I know, um, you know my biz coach is on LinkedIn. Uh, great newsletter there. So if you're looking for tips, definitely go sign up. And yeah, the new newsletter, uh, Entrepreneur's Edge, that we just yep. launched. Yeah, um, yep. that's 1,500 year. subscribers in 48 hours. Yep, not bad. Must be some yeah. good stuff in there, right? So Yeah, pretty, yeah. pretty exciting. Check out uh, both Eric's page and my biz coaches um, and sign up for both newsletters. A lot of great stuff. If you, know, you run a small business, you lead a small business, you work in a small business, just a lot of great tips. You definitely want to check it out. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, Eric, always a pleasure. Thanks again. And uh, for those watching and listening, we'll see you on the next episode of the Biz Coach Show. Awesome. Thanks.